Guys, it's that time of year again, and we're back at Holt. Today, we're gonna to be looking around the main sail, picking out some gems, and also going over to the sealed bin to check out some of the most curious guns we can find. This auction's a little bit different to the previous one. The previous one had a lot of really good stuff, but the quality standard was very level. This one, there is a huge amount of variety. We've got American guns, Japanese guns, some amazing Spanish guns, and we're gonna work our way around and try and share some of the best with you before going over to the sealed bid. I'm gonna start with this. This is an S09 by Beretta, and could be one of my favorite guns in the sale or at least probably one of the best purchases in the sale from a usability standpoint. It's lot 1667, a little 20 bore, 28 inch barreled SO9, made in 1989, I think. It's estimate 10 to 15 grand, which is no small amount of money. But considering what one of these would cost you new, or the equivalent to one of what one of these would cost you new, that's a lot of money. This one hasn't had a great deal of work, but the quality of workmanship is just best Beretta can do. And that's pretty good. All right, let's look at something Less practical. And by less practical, I'm talking about cape guns, of which there is a real good selection of in this auction, which is odd. And there's one over there we're gonna have a look at, which is on the other end of the spectrum to this. This is a Manu France Ideal 316S cape gun. You know, I've been derogatory about French guns over the years, and I don't mean to be, because inherently they are good things. But this one is interesting, well, firstly, because it's a nice Manu France, and the guys at Manu France, when given the money to build a great gun, really did. The style of these things is something else. If you remember a few years ago or a year ago, we looked at the Manu France built for the King of Afghanistan. Oh, that was something special. For those of you who don't know what a cape gun is, it's a gun with a rifle, a 12 bore with a rifled barrel. Maybe two rifled barrels, but usually one unrifled and one with a rifle choke or a paradox choke, which this has. There's some with full length, Rifling, there's one in here with two rifle barrels. What makes this one special is this, ready? That goes like that. The gun opens up and comes apart in two pieces. I understand that the concept of a two-piece gun is, is a browning thing, but it's just nice to see it done slightly differently. Also, look at that rising bite in the back. Isn't that cute? Actually good gun making, but if you take this lever here, sorry, you turn it sideways, the foring comes off, so you can get under it and clean it easy. So yeah, you have 18.5 mil, 65 mil chambered, two and a half inch chambered, reproofed in 2023. This one's a Paradox barrel, and that is a true 12 ball barrel. I believe this gun was made in about 1950. Look at the way that just levers in. This is really good gun making. And I do take back what I said about French guns in the past, because they're not all bad. They're all just slightly different. And this one is the good kind of different. And the final awesome thing about this gun is this is a working gun. That pulls up, the sling comes out of the stock, you put it on like this, and away you go. And now you can drag whatever you've killed because this gun is, well, it's a 12 ball with a rifle barrel in one and a unrifling that. This is the gun that you want to take anywhere in the world. Might not do everything the best, but does everything. Oh, what an amazing little gun. Super special, and four to six hundred pounds. A real nice workhorse gun, full of curiosities and great gun making. I didn't think it would excite me that much, but it really did. And this is the other gun I was talking about. This is a Holland and Holland. Paradox gun, both barrels have paradox rifling, meaning that end piece of the barrel is rifled. This one is, I believe, one of three ever made in that round bar modern spec. It's not particularly old, and it is extremely rare as one of three. It's definitely a gun. I don't think I'm struggling to, to appreciate it. It's just totally different to anything I've seen before out of the Holland and Holland factory. And it's good and it's solid and it just, it looks like it's from another world. But I guess that's, um, that's no bad thing. It's beautifully finished. That quarter rib is lovely. The flip up sights pop out beautifully. It is a quality piece of gun making. Just totally different to any other Holland I think I've ever seen. 
And for £60,000, if you wanted to own a very rare gun that you probably might never use, well, this would be a hell of an addition to a collection. Before we look at that gun just there, which could be the finest gun in the auction, or at least the one that has grabbed most people's hearts and attentions when it perhaps shouldn't, we're going to look at this. A gun that we've looked at quite a few of, but it seems rude not to look at it, seeing as it's one of, from one of my favourite gun makers in the world. This is a Luciano Bosis of Brescia, Italy. This is a virtually unused over and under. Beautifully, beautifully engraved by Martinelli. Absolutely lovely, that fine scroll work with the floral bouquets and, the, and that beautiful infill of basket weave. Isn't this just a beautiful thing? This is lot 1600, valued at 23 to 26,000, which again, it's a lot of money, but this gun has fired eight shots. So it is essentially new. You have the Bosis Nicta Signia on the front and the Cruciform foreign tip there, which has a number one on it. So I presume this one has a brother somewhere. You have the beautiful finned barrel, so it all mates up lovely. And this walnut is exceptional as well. Again, it's a Bosis. You shouldn't expect anything less than perfection, but yeah, what's 1600? If I had a spare 23 to 26 plus commission, I'd. Um, I'll own one of these one day. I think that's the best way to look at it. I'll own one of these one day. I've just never seen a bad one. And that is a statement and a half because every gun maker has a slip or occasionally makes something less perfect. These guys just seem to hammer it home time after time. And again, it's clearly a taste thing. Just look at that hand filed rib as well. That does all sorts of funny things to me. And I, it shouldn't because it's really not that complicated. This is proper gun making. Let's look at something completely different. This Gruyere. Are you ready for your life to be changed forever? Because what is inside this case will change your opinion on Spanish guns for the rest of time. This is a Gruyere Celtic. So this is a virtually new gun. This is a Greer case, a canvas and leather case. It's very pleasant. This was made in 2022, serial number 31030402022. The last two digits in Spanish serial codes is generally the year. It is the Celtic model, the Windsor Celtic. It's a round body 28 bore, 28 gauge. CIP steel proofed, 70 mil chambered 28. And by the name, it's covered in Celtic Band work, not work, mythical creatures. I love this gun. So I've seen pictures of them, but in the flesh it is significantly less loud than you think it would be, but also delightfully bold. So let's start with barrels. They are a chopper lump set of barrels, meaning they're two tubes put together. It's a traditional way of doing things. And they are really beautifully struck very nice indeed the gun itself weighs about six pounds the barrels are not particularly lightweight but they're steel proofed or hp steel proofed which is no bad thing going into the future and so you do want them to be thick not thin i suppose that's what that meant the action is a scaled down action it's a small frame action could be the same as their 20 i'm not entirely sure but it doesn't look out of place with those little 28s on there. In fact, the whole thing is very pleasing. Where the width of the action is similar to the width of the barrels, it's not curvy, it's just strong. And that strap work and not work across the sides on that, it, and this gun is new, pretty much new. It's new, we call it new? It's not new, but it's new. It's mint, that's a good word for it. Case color hardening, that brand new case color hardening, is that deep blue with lovely little bits of orange and brown and oh, it's just got such a depth of color. In between the strap work, it's all carved out and it's got this lovely textured background. You have a beaded trigger guard, again, fully brand new case color hardened. And you know, I, I see occasionally refurb guns in here that are UK built that have this finish and it just doesn't look quite right, but that depth of color, that richness, makes this gun look a million bucks. Cocking indicators on the side with gold inlay there, and a 14 and three quarter inch walnut stock. I tell you what, it's a very nice thing. I'd love to know the story on this gun, but how someone didn't just fall in love with it, I do not know. Maybe it's a demo, 
Maybe it was a, a cancelled order, you never know, but what an opportunity. This is lot 1554 and is valued at nine to 11,000 plus commission. I mean, it saves you ordering a new one, and if you are in the realms of normality size-wise, you could have this cast back off. It's 14 and 3 quarters long. If you had an, a leather pad on there, you'd get that to 15 and 3 quarters without it looking bad. What a lovely opportunity to own an absolutely stunning 28 gauge. I mean, you don't really care about the caliber. I don't really care about anything other than staring at this action. It is, oh, it's beautiful. A quick break from the traditional quality guns that we're really here to see to have a look at this because this is a less traditional quality gun. This is a DSR Precision 308. A German police sniper rifle, basically. It's a bit of a beast. At three to five thousand, it's really not bad value given what these things are new and the rarity of them. It's a bolt action bullpup 308. There isn't much more to say about it other than it weighs a ton, it's made of metal, and it'll make lots of noise. It's top of the Schmidt PM2, 416 by 50. This is a pretty cool rifle. If you're after something a little bit different to take down the range and go and have a bit of fun with, you ain't gonna see another one. And their accuracy is pretty legendary, or the build quality at least is pretty legendary. I can definitely appreciate that. So the March 2022 main sale has a ton of sub-gauge stuff in, small bores, sorry, in England. And that is brilliant. You don't usually see this quantity, certainly of this quality in the main sale. There's always a good amount in the sealed bid, but you know, they're all of interesting levels. This is one that jumps out of me for being a little bit different. It's a Harkerman Sons box lock ejector. Look around this action, these fences, these detonators, don't they look beautiful the way they're sort of sloped forward? And it's a style of the maker, but in the sub gauge, in that 20 bore on that small frame, isn't that just, an absolute peach. On the 12 bore, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't think it does a lot, but on this, I think that is absolutely lovely and refined. Looks like 27 inch barrels, sleeved. Yeah, they are sleeved, which is no bad thing. It's no bad thing in the modern world. Has a little bit of assurance to the quality. That doll's head on the back there, touch loose, but again, you're gonna have to accept that it's not gonna be perfect. 15.7 bores with that four end on. That's a real lovely little gun. Just beautifully put together. The price on this, I do not know, I'm afraid. I really should have checked before picking it up, but whilst you're in this room, everything jumps out at you. It's, it's a real bad place for a gun addict or anyone who loves fine gun making because there's something about everything in here that is particularly special. If you want the details, it is lot 1552. If you go on Holt's website, you can chuck the lot number in. You can go and have a little look on the small bore section of the website. There is all sorts you can go and find, whatever you want to sort of make you happy. All right, let's burn through a few or else I'm gonna be here all day looking at very specific things. There is a absolutely beautiful Thomas Horsley 28 ball, but I believe Simon might want to have a little look at that with me later. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. This, which is also stunning, a William Powell, but it's a, the Zenith made by Greer in Spain. Again, just some fine gun making, very nice, very bold, real statement piece. Love the top lever and the details on there. That's what 1519, I think that is good value from what I've looked in the book at. Before this, lot 1514 is the one I went straight to when I walked in the room because anything taller than the rest of the guns in the rack always I find very interesting because I'm a larger than average framed human. It's a round body number two, 20 bore with 32 inch barrels and a 15 and a half inch stock. For anybody taller than, you know, Michael, that is a particularly special thing. It's nice, it's tight, it's up and together. And it's a really nicely specced gun. I'm a big fan of that, actually. I think that's a, a not a bad gun for a good usable gun. And this particular set has a few more Spanish ones in than usual, but they're all good quality. And that's, that is something. There is a 28 gauge AYA, 28 bore AYA. I do struggle with this whole cross transatlantic uh, lingo thing in guns. I end up speaking to Americans half the time and English people half the time and I think we all understand each other, I think. This is quite an interesting one. 
a Centenary AYA, lot 1416. This could be, again, one of those guns that jumped off the rack at me. And that's because it's a 32 inch Centenary. That's 1915 to 2015. So it's 100 years of AYA. They made a range of these guns with this limited edition engraving. It's a beautiful gun, hand detachable locks, pistol grip, good bit of comb height, decent stock length, but the 32 inch barrels are the real peach here. What's quite interesting about this as well is that it is, I'm just going to double check that, HP steel proofed. So you can take this gun and go and lob lead or steel of whatever you wanted. And most everything in here will take steel to a fashion or within reason with slight modification. But just to have something you can just take and not worry about in a modern spec, that is a... Um, Modern man's, that's an over and under shooter's side by side if ever there was one. It's interesting that those, those drop points do come so close to your hand. Lovely thing, really lovely gun, 1416. I think that's in for about 10 grand. And I say 10 or 15 grand like it's nothing, but it obviously is something. But you have to put this into perspective. What these guns would cost you new to go and ask AOA for this gun now, you'd be paying sort of four times that much. That double paradox from Holland and Holland. If you went to Holland's now and said, can you make me a paradox gun, round body, this spec? I mean, I doubt you'd be coming away with change for 200,000. So it's all about perspective, isn't it? And we will, as I said, go to the steel bid later and look at some one, two, 300 pound guns, which are, you know, more the sort of things that we're just gonna buy on a whim. But that's dream gun material and you won't need to buy another. And as such, 10,000, when you can consider your grandkids would shoot this, you wouldn't be handing your grandkids a car that you'd bought for 10 grand today. And that's the beauty of fine gun making, I suppose, isn't it? Is that you do buy something that is an heirloom that will last the ages. All right, that's enough thinking. I'll stop thinking and start looking at guns. And in fact, while we'll starting looking, let's take a quick break, sit in the studio and have a look at this lot 1400, which is one of the finest, most usable Hollands I've seen in the sale for a long time. What a lovely thing. Let's have a look. So this is lot 1400, and I think it could be one of the best buys of the sale. It's in at 12 to 16,000, which is no small amount of money, but it's a Holland & Holland Royal. You know, it's a 150,000 pound gun. So let's call it a massive saving. But this one has had a lot of work done to bring it into a modern spec, all done by the maker. So in 2013, it had a new set of 30 inch barrels made. It is a Holland patent single trigger, which is one of the better single trigger systems. It's also a self opener. So it's one of the better designs. It's a lovely gun to use and a real good gun to operate. It's also been restocked and to restock to a very high standard, presumably by the maker. And if not, definitely to the maker's standard to 14 and three quarter. So what you have is a 30 inch Holland and Holland with a 14 three quarter inch stock and a single trigger. Those sort of things do not come up often. And the fact that the work is very light, well the barrel work is definitely done by the maker is kind of nice. It adds, it doesn't devalue the gun. That's the best way of putting it. It doesn't devalue it in any way. It adds a lot of value. It also comes with its original barrels, which are 26 and a half inch or 26 and three quarter inch, which is, perhaps less desirable nowadays, but it is a desirable addition to one of these if you then go and shoot some partridge or walk to woodcock or anything where you want to reduce weight. It's currently seven pound two, but it goes down to six pounds 11 with the lightweight or the shorter barrels. I genuinely think this is an unbelievable gun. If anyone is looking for one of those guns forever, but doesn't really want any of the quirks of buying an older gun, with this, you have all of the beauty of an original old action, but with brand new quality woodwork and brand new quality, but I say brand new, 2013 in the grand scheme of Holland and Holland Royals, that's quite new, metal work and tubes. I'm a big fan of a Holland Royal anyway, but for the most part, you know, they have short stocks and they have short barrels or thin walls, and there's always something that holds them back. There is nothing that holds this gun back. This could be the best value Holland and Holland Royal on the market. It's certainly one of the most desirable ones in the sale, if not the most desirable one in the sale. I'm just 
wishing I had 12 to 16,000 pounds right now, which I don't, or certainly I think I'd die or get killed if I spent it on this. Could be worth dying for though. Fred Baker. Interesting. Sorry, you could get lost in cases here. You really can. There are so many guns cased, even just sat by the side. And I spend a lot of time in the catalogue. I spend a lot of time on the website looking. And obviously, I have a little passion for collecting little bits myself and waiting for those things to come up and always looking for curiosities. Yeah, when you actually come here in the flesh, it's hard not to get lost. But there's always something to grab your eye. And here is one particular example. This. He's a Mackay Brown over and under 20 ball. Firstly, the cases need to definitely be appreciated. Look how perfect this is with three little tear screws all named up with David Mackay Brown. These guns are lovely. A good friend of mine owns, owns a pair and I've been lucky enough to shoot them. And yeah, they're one of the best guns. They really are unbelievable. Again, the beautiful finned barrel, but they do it slightly differently to other makers. These fins actually sit atop the wood as opposed to inside the wood. I do think that's a beautiful touch. Again, it doesn't really matter. None of this really matters, but isn't that why we get turned on by guns? By, by the things that don't matter? Because reliability and shootability should just be a thing. And we'll cock on the bottom. Yeah, this is great gun making. They do command a premium price because it's a premium product and there's such collectability. And, David Mackay Brown made some of the best guns of all time, so why shouldn't they have the following they deserve? I thought 1659. On the subject of cases, here is an interesting little lot. This is lot 926. Let's put that brown away. But this little case is interesting in that it's a continental all leather case, meaning it weighs absolutely nothing. There's no oak, no wood, no support in here. This is completely leather. It's got a lovely story as well, which is interesting. Let's just have a quick look inside because it's just a bit special. Likely made in France, it's continental, which is lovely. Look at the handle and how it attaches to all of this. Isn't that awesome? Just pop it open, have a look inside. I really shouldn't be that excited by a beautiful leather case, but it's a real skill to make one of these. You have a little barrel flopper there, so you stick your little 20 ball barrels by the look of it into there. They then clip down, you've got elastic in the bottom for your cleaning rods. And, oh, I just think it's lovely. I know that's not that exciting. It's about 150-ish pounds estimate. But what's interesting about this is it belonged to the Prince of Battenberg, who unfortunately died in World War One. But just a lovely piece of history, a lovely piece of leather craft, and it's got a great little story that you can, again, read on the website. All right, let me share this with you. This is an absolute beautiful little gun. A little Watson Brothers gun. I mean, it's been restocked and recased and reblacked, and it's been done very nicely. It's also been re-sleeved. It's a 1898 gun, which is old and was originally Damascus, but it's been sleeved from Damascus into steel tubes, 27 inch. Apparently when it was re-sleeved, there was discussion about making it a 30 inch or a 29 inch or something a little bit more modern, but then it wouldn't fit in the case. So that was decided against. The stock on this one is cast left hand, which is again, not the end of the world. It's gonna be easy enough to bend right-handed if you really wanted, but it is really long. I think 16 inches? Also, I had a little play with it earlier. It definitely feels not far out for me other than the cast. The workmanship on the rebuild is absolutely beautiful. It was done not long ago, in 2018, this gun was redone. And that is, and it was done to a high standard too, certainly high enough. This is a lovely little usable 28 ball, 28 gauge, which don't come around often. You know, usually you've got a tiny little stock or Something that's less than pleasant. Yeah, that's got to be 16 and a quarter. Two and a half to three and a half thousand for a 125 year old box lock ejector 28. What a lovely thing. What a lovely usable gun. Big fan of that. Really big fan of that. Arguing myself about why I shouldn't buy it other than, you know, other things I should pay for, like, you know, life, houses. Family, cars, taxes, the miserable stuff. 
but that will serve somebody really well. What a real lovely thing. Actually, before I put it away, there is obviously a much more important reason they probably didn't make it longer, and that's because trying to find sleeving tubes for a 28 gauge is hard. Finding them probably longer than 27 is probably impossible. For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of sleeving, because every time I refer to a sleeve gun, someone asks in the comments, what they do is you take a pair of barrels and you cut them off there. So you're left with just the chamber, the lumps, and all of this sort of lockup part, which is essentially the hardest bit to make for a gun. What you then do is you mill out the inside up to a point, usually about here, and then you take a tube that's tapered to the original taper and bore thickness of the barrel, hopefully. Usually they go a little bit heavier. Uh, depending on the quality of the job, it's obviously a lot harder to, to try and match it perfectly than it is to make a slightly heavier set of barrels. And in a lot of instances, it's no bad thing to make them slightly heavier or thicker than they were new, given that modern cartridges are bigger, hotter, and harder. Anyway, you take those and you insert them into the hole you've cut out, so you retain then the chamber joins up, it then goes into the original into a new forcing cone, and bosh out the end of the barrel. You then relay the ribs back on, and essentially what you've done is you've turned a demi-block barrel into a monoblock barrel. And that's the real simple way of putting it, but that's also the easiest way of, of putting it, I think. Sleeving affects value negatively most of the time. Obviously, a sleeved barrel is preferable to one that is out of proof, pitted and unusable. However, it is not preferable to new. So the value sits somewhere in the middle. Obviously, a gun that cannot be used is relatively worthless because it's something that needs to be done to bring it up to spec. Either a new barrel, resleeving, or some kind of job needs to be done. However, over the original barrels, this will have affected the value negatively. This is because originality is king, you're only in original condition once, a la Simon Reinhold, and you do want an original gun. However, where they can be good is in creating a beefier, stronger gun. And when you buy a sleeved gun, you can usually be happy or content that it will be stronger potentially than an original. The wall thicknesses will be thicker than most originals, and it removes a lot of that doubt when buying an earlier gun. And I know a lot of friends, when they're dabbling into their first side-by-side -side vintage guns will be happier buying a sleeve gun firstly because it's a little bit less money b because you're not gambling so much with wall thicknesses and bore sizes and things that's a bit of a minefield when you first get into it i have no problem with sleeve guns i own a few of them and for the most part they're good a bad sleeving job is not a nice thing because it adds a lot more weight to the gun and as such you lose a bit of balance but a good sleeving job it's no bad thing at all. Simon Reinhold, how are you? I'm all right, how are you? I'm all right, thank good. you. It's been a good day. Yeah, it's welcome a, back. It's a good auction. To terra firma, this side of the pond. Yes, it's quite nice. I've been calling everything gauge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. You know, different terms for different, same things. You've chosen a few guns that you'd like to share, or I asked you to choose a few guns. You did, more yeah. More importantly, that you think are good stuff. I... Uh, my personal favourites uh, in the sale, yeah, and they're not run of the mill. I like th I like fine quality guns made by gun makers who aren't necessarily the most famous in the world. Yeah, we well, seem to get a bit more. There's a bit more curiosity about it. Better value for money sometimes. Yeah, they're less sort of withheld by their own. Yeah, and I actually think a lot of them are underrated or undersung. Let's put it that way. Okay. They're not given the airtime, the coverage, the ink. The, the more famous names in the trade are. And that doesn't make them any less quality. It just means that those who buy them are seeking out a, I don't know, a refined gun making rather than a name is what we're looking for here. Yeah. Quality of build over quality of showmanship. Yeah. yeah. And I've got three here that yeah. I think fit those. A single panels. barrel. Yeah. A side by side. Yeah. 28. Yeah. And a rifle. Yeah, and that is the headline terms for what is actually some really, really good quality gun making here. Um, we'll start with the single barrel and the side lock, I think. So this here is Thomas Horsley of York. And Horsley is one of the finest gun makers that Britain ever produced, based in York, um, and churned out not only really, really good quality guns. He didn't churn them out, that's not fair. He produced really good quality guns for the gentry of Yorkshire and the surrounding area. But he also came up with some patents of his own that are 
totally different. Okay. Um, and we've got a very high quality side lock, which we'll come on to talk to uh, in a London style. But this is typical Horsley. 1863, he came up with a patent for, everybody was at the time producing opening mechanisms on breech loaders. And bear in mind, breech loaders weren't, you know, that common in 1863. In 1863. A lot of them were um, still percussion and muzzle loaders. Uh, early breech loaders were cumbersome and awkward and had very, lots of bits sticking out underneath and interesting hinges and mechanisms to draw back style. or push yeah. forward or to Big the side. And none of it, when you're looking at, you know, those who were shooting percussion muzzle loaders, the, the lines had become very elegant and refined. And all of a sudden there was lots of bits sticking out of the bottom and people were going, surely we can do better. So Horsley dedicated quite his, his considerable intellect to coming up with something that was a bit better. His second attempt was this. This is the sliding top lever, or the pull back top lever, slide open sometimes called, uh, on a single barrel, 12 bore with a 30 inch Damascus barrel. And it's typical Horsley, really finely made. There's a beautiful rope work engraving there. On the side of the uh, on the top of the action, just uh, on the side of the barrel there, it's it's really nicely done. Symmetrical fences here. There's no need to have that symmetry there. That's just elegance going into gun making. That's what he was interested in, and he got the lines. It's beautiful, right? It really is beautiful. Um, the colour on this is actually um, tobacco smoke and wood smoke from being hung over a fireplace. I think is what has coloured this action a bit, um, and some of it has been tidied up a little bit, but they never got around to taking off that tarnish off the top lever. But it's one of those, this is my kind of gun making. It's elegant, it's refined, it's highest quality, but also with idiosyncratic patents. He moves on to this, which turned up, which is also one of my favorite guns in the sale. And this is, this is a rare beast in that I've said it in public before, I can count on one hand the number of highest quality English side-lock ejectors that are around in 28 bore, and this is one. I actually, I have a client, a game shooting client, who is 13 years old, who's very lucky that his father has allowed him to use a 28 bore side-lock ejector. And I said to him last season, you will go a long way, long time before you see another one of these. And lo and behold, one pitches up in the auction. This one is Horsley. Um, it's Roger's patent, which is a lever cocking patent. Um, so slightly different. And they were lever cocking. Roger's patent was very popular in London before, as everybody was going through the patent refinement. Um, Roger's patent was an extremely popular one. But the thing about Horsley is you can see the woodwork might get, you might think that's a little flat and dull. Mm -hmm. Horsley did not do the kind of flor florid woodwork that other gun makers did because he was looking for straight grain for a gun to last. Yeah. He wasn't interested in flash, Proper he wanted function. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that is one of the reasons that the woodwork on Horsley's is perhaps less figured than others is because all he was interested in was the strength through the hand. If it came with beautiful wood as well, fantastic, but actually to be honest with you, he didn't really he didn't worry about that. Um, what he was worried about is strength, inherent strength, his guns lasting, his guns functioning, and being built to the highest quality. And this is one. Yeah, it's sensibly priced, um, but expect to have to fight hard to get it. Yeah, and for those who fail, there's an OA number four over there. Yeah, there you go. You can get in that one. With the wooden spoon version. <laughs> yes, you can get in that one. It's way. still a beautiful gun in its own yeah. right. And it's Horsley of York. Beautiful. Good maker, underrated. Moving on. Moving on. We have a rifle. This is a rare one for me because I don't normally choose a rifle as my gun of the sale, but this one when it came in completely stopped me in my tracks. Josh brought it back from Evaluation Day down in the southwest of England, and the guy didn't really know what it was um, or how interesting it is or how exciting it is. It's just an old rifle. Because it looks like just an old rifle. Um, but this is a six and a half by 54 Manlika Schoenhaar. Um, from Daniel Fraser, one of the great rifle makers of all time, to be honest with you. By those who understand and use vintage rifles a lot, Daniel Fraser is actually rated up there above his uh, master who he apprenticed to, Alexander Henry. Oh, wow. Yeah, that much wow. So he put 
extra effort into building these rifles. This is a takedown rifle and the fit, the finish of everything on it is absolutely superb. It's seen some life, so it's not in pristine condition, but you want to see it that way. It's not supposed to be hung on a wall or put in a cabinet or behind a glass sheet. Right, and if sheet it was mint, then it, it, it wouldn't excite the same passion because you look at that and go, I want to go hunt with that. Yeah, exactly. You really do. And the, the gun fit of a rifle is often overlooked, especially these days. This rifle comes up absolutely superbly into the shoulder. Your eye is perfectly with the, the notch in the post. And it's a beautiful thing. It's just, it's not very extensively engraved, but one of the trademarks of Fraser rifles is the side of the trigger blade is engraved. It's so beautiful. You know, people who put that much effort and go to that level of detail, mm. and that was his, you know, he did that on his rifles because he, you can just see him pouring his heart and soul into these things. It's unusual because we only ever sold three of right, these right, Daniel Fraser okay. takedown rifles. So did he make a lot or is he just you haven't seen No, them? he didn't because he died quite young. He died at the age of 53. Um, and was lamented by many, including WDM Bell, who was a really good friend of Fraser's, um, tested rifles for him in 1901. He was testing um, big game double rifles, hated it, and on record as saying, you know, it shook me to my very bones. Yeah, that's not a job um, anybody really No, but they like were good, that. they were really good friends, really close yeah. friends. And actually, um, Bell is on record as saying that his takedown Daniel Fraser was the best rifle he ever owned. So he really did rate them highly and he's one of the most famous elephant hunters of all time. Um, but the quality is all there. It's all there. Uh, the interesting thing from a gun making perspective is the fact that it's still got the, the military style bolt knob, which is not usual for Fraser because Fraser is famous, and I've got an example here on just an action, for a particular style of bolt handle, which is this slightly stylized elongate straight down and then a little lip up with a fully checkered and split into four ways that is classic fraser that his design um, he did also do a flat blade which is the known as the butter knife bolt mm -hmm. handle so this is slightly unusual with this fully rounded and hollowed yeah, out been a, a custom order probably order yeah probably somebody wanted that specifically because the they liked the tactileness of it to be able to get back and get yeah, forward and i must admit that rifle runs so sweet yeah when, when we got here and picked up and you gave it to me and said, have a look at that. Go, cool. Yeah, it really does. It's it a gorgeous thing. Proper special. Thank you very much, Simon. No worries. I hope it goes to a good home. I really do. I hope it goes to somebody who will use it. So here we have something that you really don't ever see in England. This is a Parker reproduction made by Winchester in the Olinco Denture plant in the late 80s. I never thought I'd see one of these in England, but I can say that for a lot of things in this sale. And we're going to have a good look over it because the opportunities to have a good look over one of these on home turf is pretty minimal. This gun is valued at an, an, sort of an English price. It's valued at 800 to 1200. It's lot 1561, which is very reasonably priced what, versus what this would sell for in the USA. The story of the Parker reproduction is an interesting one. Parker original guns stopped being produced a long time ago, back in the what, late 30s. And then in the late 80s, somebody who really wanted to remake it went to Olin Codentia. Olin Codentia bounced some ideas around with them. It took them a long time to hit the specs and requirements that they wanted. Their demand for original build, but with superior quality, original design, but with superior quality machining and with superior quality components and superior quality control was, um, was impressive. I, I'd have loved to have sat in on some of those negotiations. I bet that that was a hard discussion to have. So it got to the point that they were actually having original forgings made. And if you watched a video of the gun I bought in the sealed bid, that classic doubles 201, that was actually made out of the same forgings that they had for these. This is a 20 gauge DHE grade Parker reproduction. And I am actually really impressed with the quality. Not that I've ever been not impressed by the quality of something that came out of the Olin Cadentia plant because it was uh, the best or nothing really, or at least the standard was extremely high. Let's work through this gun back to front because it deserves a bit of uh, attention for the record books. It's got a 14 and a quarter inch American walnut stock with this skeletal metal butt plate at the back, with that beautiful inlet there. Again, this was a original Parker feature that they decided to fit onto these rather than the Parker plastic butt plate. And I think it's, I mean, 
that kind of workmanship, firstly the fitting is fantastic. You have to remember this was made in the late 80s. And it, it really does, you could fool someone to say it was made earlier other than some of the sort of sneaky bits of engraving and some of the things you can tell. But that workmanship is fantastic. The gun's checkered through a straight stock. You have a little safety catch of the original design. It must have been really tempting for them to be like, nah, we like it this way, we want to improve this, we want to improve that. So while it's actually really important to have the guys in charge be so militant about keeping it original. Even the stock dimensions are originally flat as a pancake, which again, must have been tempting not to be like, let's just tweak those up a little bit. You have an extended trigger guard with an oval in there and a single selective trigger. I don't know how those operate, but I presume they're going to be pretty good. Everything I've seen about Parkers is that they were designed to be reliable and easy to put together in a factory environment. Perhaps not from a gunsmithing perspective. I think there's a lot more working parts in one of these than there needs to be, but that's by the by. I'd love to have a little look at that single trigger and see what, how that operates. The action itself is a DHE grade, so it comes engraved with a pointer on one side and this acanthus scroll. What's interesting about it is it's hand-finished rolled engraving. It does surprise me. Not a lot, but it does surprise me. I guess it was also about making these guns down to a affordable price, as was always the, the Parker thing. But it does surprise me, perhaps, that they didn't hand-engrave them all or something like that. But inherently, it looks prettier than some of the originals I've seen, just by proxy of it being a little bit more uniform. I'm a big fan of this. For a little 26-inch thing, I had the opportunity to sort of learn more about these and, and kind of not get bitten by the bug, but at least start to appreciate the Parker dream and the Parker ethos of Old Reliable. Even got that doll's head extension in the top there, which is lovely. Before we finish up in here by looking at the catalog cover Abbey Attica, which is stunning. This is a little 16 ball hammer gun, non-ejector, with Beretta's patented monoblock barrels at this point, obviously. And they'd have them on there for a very long time, but it's nice to see, or it's interesting to see monoblock barrels of a, on a gun of this age. 18.6 bore, 70 mil. Huh? Sorry, we got distracted for a second there because it's got a 18.6 caliber size on there when it's clearly not actually 18.6 because that's 12 bore, more or less. Yeah, this is a lovely piece of Beretta history. You know, as gun making goes, perhaps it's not the most beautiful thing, but it is a very collectible little item. There's definitely a dog with a, it's a very fat dog on the other side. It's an interesting little gun, but a four to six hundred pounds for somebody who loves Beretta. I know you, someone who just loves gun making history and wants a actual piece of it. Monoblock Beretta Brescia. This is a piece of gun making history. I tell a lie, this isn't the front cover gun. This is a Yil Dit Elegant. A5, I think it is, a little 410 side by side. And to all accounts, lot 1508 shouldn't be in the main sale because it's a Turkish side by side. Knew they are, what, 700 pounds? They're not, not a lot of money. It's second hand, this is probably, I guess, 250 to 300. But what makes this special is not the gun. Although, you know, it's a very nice Turkish side by side for the right money. What makes this gun special is this. This is a wooden box. What's inside it is quite exciting. Open it up and you'll see you have the original piece of wood that goes like that. But what some clever sod has done is create a set of four pads that just... Ready for this? Click into place. What an awesome little thing. And again, you've got a little screw on the top of each of them so you can lock them in place. This, you know, I've seen a lot of people attempt this kind of job and not do an amazing job, to be quite frank. There's a lot of quick ons, quick offs that look okay and they, they're very functional but don't have this kind of beauty of aesthetic. This is a cool thing, and I've no idea why I now want to own this gun, but it's mostly just for this system, which isn't that superb or special. It's a bit of brass, nicely milled, a nut, two little rods, and then a locking nut that goes on the inside. It is, to all intents and purposes, a very basic system, but it's so perfectly 
done with the leatherwork, or it's so beautifully done with the leatherwork, hiding all of that wood that actually. Why wouldn't you want to own this gun? So we wrap up a main sale. I must apologize, I've missed out some unbelievable guns, a beautiful 2-2, some unbelievable bolt action rifles, so many quality box locks, some really nice side locks. The, I mean, the world is your oyster in this sale. The variety is above and beyond what has been in here for a, a little while. The, the quality is more variable as well, but, but for me, I find that more exciting because you never know what you're gonna stumble over. Racks upon racks, legion upon legion of best London side lock is a sight to behold, but it's not quite so quirky and interesting as this sale. And this is the front cover of the sale. This is a FAMARS with two barrels. The first is this, a 375 H&H &H over and under barrel set. And the second is this, a little 12 bore over and under, 70 mil chambers, ejector barrel set, and they're numbered one and two, each with their own forend. This is a beautiful concept, but it's the engraving that gets me, and the quantity of time that it took the two engravers to make this a reality. This was engraved at Academia Il Bolino by Bonsi and Vatella, and it's, it's something special, it really is. You have a real interesting mixture of this carved textured background and the quantity of hours it would have taken to put in that texture and do it that beautifully is, I mean, that's something else. It's such a vivid textural change between the flats of the acanthus and that textured background and also how this textured finish matches into this forend for the 375 and this forend for the shotgun barrels is beautiful. You have, well, Firstly, you all know I can't resist a detachable trigger, so it's obviously why I'm in love with it. But just the quantity of hours put into that background and then that top lever that's all beautifully carved and that safety catch, which is in itself just, I mean, you could hang that off of a chain and call it a necklace, it's that beautiful. The game scenes that have been put in as well of the buffalo on one side and the elephant on the other, it's just quality work and you know i'm an abbey attico fan we did a full video on them if you want to learn about the history in a bit more in depth a few months ago which is definitely worth a watch got the rhino on the bottom as guns that you can visually fall in love with oh famars really do sit up there in terms of quality and this one in particular is just bold and different and brave it's got a nice light piece of woodwork on there that won't be to everyone's tastes I know that certainly if this was my gun, I might want something a bit more subtle because I do feel like that the aggressive quality of the wood, that really loud, bold statement pulls away from the artwork that is that engraving. That is something that those engravers should be extremely proud of. That is wild and beautiful. So let's head over to the sealed bid, have a little look in there, see what they've got. There's definitely a few things I've spotted on the website that are right up my street and a few things that I just want to have a look at out of morbid curiosity, which is actually how I end up bidding on most of the things because I just want to have a closer look, want to have a look inside. But with the sealed bid, that's what it's all about. The sealed bid is about fun and buying guns that are, well, you don't find anywhere else, that are also extremely beautiful. The main sale is about falling in love every 30 seconds. Well, let's walk over to the other room. So this is the sealed bid room. For those of you who don't know, this is where most of the more reasonably priced guns come. It's not a progressive auction buying stuff here. You go online, you bid what you wanna pay. If you're the highest, you win it. It's a very simple way of buying guns. And I should know, I always used to say to myself, do not get high on your own supply. Don't go to Holtz and Film and then place bids straight that day. Be disciplined. And that went out the window about a year ago, as many of you know. So, uh, yeah, I fully intend to play some more bids today and cause more mayhem in my gun cabinet. But for now, let's have a little look around because there are some absolute beauties. This, this like the main cell, is just as varied, just as wild. And I'm going to start with something that we've seen one of before that I then bought. <laughs> this is uh, not a good thing. <laughs> this is a 5151. This is a Cromson. 
Olympic model. For a while, the Spanish team was sponsored by a company called Cromson. This is a Crom. It's quite an interesting thing. This is a sporting one, though. Ooh, I feel now I need to add this to my collection. The, oh my god. Sorry for blaspheming. That was very rude, but I mean, that is a wooden heel with a rubber plate dovetailed into it. That is a wooden stock with a very recoil pad on the toe. What's interesting about the Gromson Sporting, I've got a trap, which is the Olympic team used. This clearly is caught the same choke in the top barrel and none in the bottom. And what makes it sporting is that this is wild. So anyway, they made guns for a couple of years. They're quite interesting. They're based off of a modified boss action. But they sponsored the Spanish Olympic team, who came like seventh in the Olympics whilst they were sponsored by them, which is no bad place to be. Seventh is better than anything after seventh. They're quite well made, but the most important and interesting thing is the shim systems. They've got a series of three shims that you can swap, change, remove, to pitch your stock left, right, up or down. Uh, pretty cool, huh? I mean, I think that's really interesting, but I'm also uh, an idiot, because I bought one. I think I paid 125 for mine, which is probably in the right ballpark in my head. And I was really worried about it because it was a bit of a, a rustier, more rotten one than this. So I presume this is probably a few quid more. But I tell you what, I bought it with the intentions of doing it up for Sasha and then realized that we both work 60 hour weeks and our families and lives outside of that. So me ever doing something up is uh, pretty minimal. But we've taken it and shot it a few times. And although the fit is a bit trappy, mate, it moves well. For 125 odd pounds, the triggers are good, it ejects and it blows clays to smithereens. This embodies the sealed bid for me. It's got a cool story, cool backstory, real gold, a maker that you don't know a lot about. It's certainly an interesting piece of gun making, and you can take it out and blow stuff up with it. Oh, yes, that's the sealed bid. Buy the gun, have fun researching it. You get all of the joy of the big sale, but without any of the responsibility of actually caring for the, the items that you buy. Not that you don't have responsibility to look after some of these things in here, because there are some unbelievably beautiful guns with great stories and great histories. But, um, you know what I mean. Moving on, there's a great selection of semi-automatics in here and pump actions, some sub gauges, some real interesting stuff. And as always, the good collection of converted military rifles. But there's one little gun I'd like to point out to you because I had never seen one until today. And this is this, a Swedish gun, a Bergslagbörsen, a Bergslagbörsen, Flipstad, Sweden, stainless steel, 12 by 70. It's a 70 mil chamber, two and three quarter inch pump action. And it looks like an ABBA outfit. And I say that with Swedish heritage, so I can, you know, I think that's an acceptable thing to say. But this is pretty wild. The Swedes have got a interesting history of gun making and currently have, what, uh, Vuvapen, Vigor Olsons, who makes lovely rifles. But they also have an interesting history of developing guns. You have Flodman guns. Uh, back in the day, they were the first people to pr sort of try out a titanium barrel. They had the glue together and that, that didn't work very well because glue and guns are not like the best mixture. Certainly gun barrels and glue are not the best mixture because there's little explosions, lots of vibrations. And remember, as you fire a shot, that barrel micro swells all the way down and only by a little bit. But if you do that every so often, glue is not going to hold up quite the same as something more malleable like, I don't know, solder. This is a pump action, a top feed pump action. And it's... um. It's definitely cool. You've got a little button there. Firstly, you've got the safety catch, which is just a trigger block. It's got very minimal movement. You have a little button there to get the slide going. And the slide runs up and down an angled bar at the front. So the slide comes down as you come back and up as you go forward. It's a very short stroke, probably because it's a 70 mil, so you're not looking for that longer stroke like most pumps are three and a half. And the coolest part is this. 
It is top feed. I mean, this gun doesn't fill me with great joy, all wires and stuff, but it is, in its own way, a hell of a racy looking machine. This is a two piece four end glued around a central synthetic carrying piece. Oh, look at that grip gap. I have absolutely no idea what's original and what's not on this gun. But what I do know is it looks like a futuristic gun from the 70s and 80s. I think it's in for about 250 to 350-ish. I do feel like I need to own it. I mean, my forefathers say that I need to own it. But I feel I'm also gonna be bidding against a few other people. What an interesting gun. So I tell you what, it, it, the trigger pull's great. It mounts well. You've got this kind of weird integral stainless steel barrel. Is it stainless steel barrel? I presume so. Anyway, that's enough. What a wild little thing. It's amazing what you stumble across. And that's not even one of the ones I had planned to show you, but what an awesome thing. Let's find the next thing. Got something for you. I mean, I like a Remington the same as the next man. And I, I kind of almost respect Remington. I don't think that this is particularly respectful. I don't, respect's the wrong word. Taste, it's definitely not tasteful, is it? No, it's definitely not. Oh, mate. Oh, that, I mean, that will make someone real happy. That will make, I mean, look at it. It's, it's like a burnt, ready, purpley. You know, if your missus came over and nails that color, you go, that's nice. What I'd like to show you is I spotted this. Again, not something I want to show you, but how do you walk into a room filled with guns and not pick something up? This is a Revo Duo. You'll be uh, au fait with the Benelli M3. You've seen one on the channel a couple of times. The Turkish gun makers have got very good at copying the M2, rotating bolt head, similar design, and that's that. This is another gravy, a different gravy. This is another kettle of fish, some would say. This is an M3 copy. The M3, as you might have just seen, you have a lock on the front, so you can go bang, 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 and it will go chunk, 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 chunk and rack through its, I don't know, four shots, or three plus one, or whatever it is, or two plus one. But if you want to use a lighter load, like a shorty, you unclick that, and it connects straight to the rods, and you can just go. What that means is you can use shorty ammo, you can use 21 grams, you can load what up whatever you want, or if you just want to cycle one out, you can just pump away. I think a lot of those M2 copies are quite good. This doesn't feel quite so good. The M3, it's a hard thing to get right. Let's go with that. It's quite a hard thing to get right. I mean, they've got plastic tracks and stuff, so it doesn't feel bad. It just doesn't... You know when you pick up an auto or a pump gun and it sort of fills you with confidence? I'm not getting that feeling from that. And I get that feeling from a lot of cheap guns. Somebody... Yeah, they have. Somebody has got an old Beretta Silver Pigeon pump and silenced it. We looked at that beautiful old Beretta in the other room, a right classic. This is, this is a classic Beretta. And somebody has, I don't know, it, it's designed to be a workhorse, right? Just some things cut deeper than others, that's all. Whilst we're here, I'll tell you what, this is, I think I've missed being at Holtz. It's weird, isn't it? Definitely missed being at Holtz. This is a Belgium, Gun. It is 5464. 5464 is a 28 gauge top lever hammer gun. Good tight ish action, he says. A good tight action, good clean bores. It's a Damascus barreled gun under that patina, I believe. Not that it particularly matters. I don't think anyone's going to buy this and re black brown it or restore it. But this is, I think, 200 pounds estimate. I spotted this online and was like, I've got to check it out and see if it's nice. And it's certainly nice enough. One of the horns of the stock is cracked, but for 200 pounds, you could own a 28 bore, 28 gauge hammer gun side by side that you could just go and enjoy. And there's nothing wrong with just enjoying a gun for enjoyment's sake. It doesn't have to always be beautifully made and full of whatever. Because for 200 pounds, if you want to sample what it's like to have a 28 gauge side by side hammer gun, phew, what a treat. 
I do think that's very nice. All right, I need to get out of here. I'm getting, uh, firstly, addicted. I'm spotting more guns and I'm getting mildly claustrophobic. Oh, the savage fox. So I actually wanted to put a bid on this, but I'm not anymore because I've shown you it. And uh, once I've shown it on here, seemingly, then everything I show seems to sell for more than I bid on it. This is the savage rendition of the fox side by side. Slightly different internals than led to believe and significantly lesser quality and you can smell that on it. I mean, Savage are not renowned for being best gun makers and good robust rifles and they've made an array of interesting guns over the years, but this, I mean, I might still have a flutter on it. It's not lovely. You know that classic doubles I bought in the last sale? It's got a little bit of that about it if that classic doubles wasn't made very well. Got a raised rib that's held on by a Phillips screw. The stock is, I mean, it is, oh wow, it's not nice. Okay, there you go, I'm definitely not bidding on this. But you know what it is, it's a, if you wanna go and win a 20 gauge event, or a 20 gauge side-by-side -side event, a 20 bore side-by-side -side event, it does handle quite well, it's a big, I mean, this is like seven pounds. That's a, that's a lot of weight for a 20 bore side-by-side. -side. That was depressing. All right, before I leave, one more. Darn. We've seen Darns in the main sale many times. All of the rare ones, high grade ones are in there. This is not a high grade one. This is just a standard case color hardened action, the classique, I believe they call it. But it still has that same Darn action. This is lot 5469. It's like 200 quid. 200 pounds you could buy a Darn. And I strangely know that some people dream of owning a darn and i don't mean that strange because inherently it is a awesome gun right it's an awesome gun plus you get to own something a bit weird and a bit niche that is good and reliable and that counts for a lot but it's it's still a darn and it still handles like a darn and feels like a darn but i mean the action's cool okay let's get out of here I've now spoken about every gun in the rack, and I promised that I wouldn't do that. Nick Holt of Holton. Steve with no last name. <laughs> nice work. We'll know. We'll know. Yeah, there you go. Fine now, software and now you know. Well, we'll know. We do know, Steve. We'll know. Yes, that's good. We're here to discuss this, which just looks like a bullet to me. Right. Okay. What's the lot number, first of all? The lot number is 7590. Okay, so 7590. It doesn't come up until the seal bid. Okay, so this is, is a sealed bid item. Yeah. Oh. So there's not, a, not, not on the main sale. So the sealed bid is, it has all the ammunition mm -hmm. in, in which we, we, we're, we're, we're selling. It's on, it's got the, do you know how it works, the sealed bid? Yes. You do, okay. Yes. Well, it's very simple. You see the estimate, and you just put down what you want to pay. Yes, and as I've learned, you have to bid over the estimate if you actually want to win. Well, you do, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Serious always, bids win, yes, unfortunately. I'm always going to put a little bit tempting, a little bit low, yes. just to tempt the boys. And more importantly, everybody's going to be bidding in that range, which is a toughie. Well, I would argue that anything it's worth what somebody's prepared to pay for that, it. That's a good way of putting it, but then the estimate should be a wider bracket. Oh, Hence there less, being an estimate of 200 to 400 on that All right, back really to the little thing. 200 to 400 pounds for a bullet that you can't use. Or for a, an inert. Uh, sorry, yes. an, a piece of ammunition that you cannot use. A Indeed, cartridge a cartridge. That you cannot use. That, well, would you really want to use 200 to 400 pounds worth on one bang? <laughs> well, <laughs> one bang. that's a good question. Well, look, what is it? It is, I would suggest, the rarest ordnance cartridge for the Martini Henry. Just before the start of the First World War, mm -hmm. when things were getting a little bit adjacent mm -hmm. and our German um, adversaries mm -hmm. were known to have a very useful supply of Zeppelins that could come over and observe and do yeah. nasty things to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea was, how can we bring them down? Okay. And there wasn't really any way of being able to bring them down. So the solution 
that was not only proposed but also took part was to create an incendiary bullet, send the observer up in the scouts, a little biplanes that were whizzing around at that stage yeah. of the war, yeah, Good with a Martini Henry carbine. To stick off the wing mirror. Yeah, indeed. indeed. <laughs> and try to shoot the Zeppelins down with this. And this, <laughs> I know, it is laughable. Um, Did it work? There is no recorded uh, occasion No one where killed the Zeppelin with a... No. <laughs> okay. But let, let, Five, seven, seven, let, four, let, let's just say that if I was an observer and placed in that position of trying to shoot down with this, which is known as the Mark I incendiary, mm -hmm. uh, my aim might be quite yeah. off. If you big know what target, I mean. big target, yeah, and big an, target, um, and an even bigger bang if it actually worked. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. You want to be a near that? Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris. out of interest, this didn't work. It got shelved relatively quickly. They were making these um, in 1914 and 1915, and oh, by that see, time, see, yeah, it would just became now. obsolete. So, what you've got here, the, these cartridges yeah. were originally intended to be used for. Uh, the Indian Army, so you've got, on my head stamp here, mm -hmm. you've got the broad arrow with the eye underneath it to mm -hmm. indicate Indian Army, mm -hmm. and you have got, if you can see there, you've got Royal Laboratories, yeah. RL, with another broad arrow between it. Mm -hmm. And how that, rare is that? I've been collecting Martini Henry accoutrements, rifles, anything to do with the Martini Henry, for far too many years, and this is only the second one that I've ever seen. Thank you, gentlemen. Oof. Should we go look at some guns? Yes, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> just about to go through these over and unders, and I'm just thinking how many guns I've fallen in love with in here. A lot more than what I've bought. I think having like an affinity for weird over and unders and weird guns that have absolutely no value, but other than interest, is probably no good thing. AYA, 20 bore. This is not what I came to look at, but it's amazing how these things kind of jump out of you and you just can't help but have a little look and see what gems you can find. That's how, that's how these things operate. And to be fair, I spend probably too much of my time on the website looking through, looking for updates, looking for new releases, brand new GTI there. That is a nice one. Doesn't look like a GTI stock to me. Looks like a GTI trap stock. Not that that matters in particular, it's 5212. In fact, that stock is probably an improvement, certainly with that beaver tail forehead. But the barrels are... I tell you what, it's because it's a GTI trap, but it's not marked up as such. But trap barrels, trap stock, trap forward, probably a trap gun. There's a Winchester 5210. I'm not going to look at any Winchesters this time, given that I, last time I looked at one and thought, I'll give that a go. I mean, I don't regret any of the money I spent on that. That was an amazing gun. A really good find. 20 gauge. Bakel. That was deceptively nice looking from a distance. I have to take my glasses off because apparently when you see the details of these guns, they're suddenly less attractive. Taking glasses off, it's like putting on beer goggles, isn't it? Everything just looks two points better than it was. That is probably the least nice browning B25A1 I think I've ever seen. I'm not gonna give you the lot number, but it's just, yeah. You know when something just doesn't look right? I can't put my finger on what that is. It just doesn't, look like it's been worked on badly. So just picked up this 7000 grade 3, beautifully engraved, nice piece of wood, dry as a bone, definitely in need of some love. But what's interesting, this is a 1989 gun, so it's based off a slightly different trigger hanger mechanism or trigger sear mechanism. You can see why people think that Marooks have terrible triggers from back in the day, and they don't because the old Brownies had the same kind of trigger, but it's amazing how you take for granted how clean those Browning triggers are now versus what they were. Oh, speaking of cool, this is the least desirable Maruka of all time, a 3000. However, something about them I still kind of enjoy. That sliding top shroud, that makes it obviously basically a Kriegoff, as anybody like who owns a Valmet or a Tika or anything along these lines, or a Maruka 3000 will tell you, or Remington, but it's not. But they are quite good guns all the same. I've been tempted to buy a few over the years. I'm not tempted by that one though. The beauty of most other bra like standard Browning action based Marukus is they're real easy to get parts for, to upgrade, to interchange. 
that is not. If anything breaks in that, that becomes a bit of a nightmare. And that's not good. And that you would need to be careful for. Not that careful. It's just, depends what you're after out of a gun, right? As I said many times, if you're after a workhorse, buy a workhorse. Browning based, Beretta based. If you're after something cheap and enjoyable, a bit like buying an old cheap sports car. Don't expect it not to go wrong, but enjoy it whilst it works. And that's not, not like a, a thing that all the guns in here are gonna break or anything, just you have to put it in the back of your mind because you're spending money, not everything works out. Luckily, everything I've ever bought works out, but I've also come here, test it, feel it. Also, the last two I bought, I bought completely blind because the steel bid wasn't ready when we came to film or we came a bit early. And so I bought them completely blind, sight unseen. Which, but give these guys a call, the beauty of Holtz. Give them a call, drop them an email. What's this like? And they'll always be brutally honest. They'll tell you it's terrible. Um, and then you'll, it'll arrive and you'll feel quite good about life. Franchi Harrier. <laughs> this can't be something good. Oh, yes. How's this? This is a bit of an oddie. This is a grade six. This is a 5344. This is a Browning 45 or 325 grade six. And and it'll be f 1999. Uh, this is nice. That is not an original stock. I don't think. All right, what's wrong with it? Same as B. I mean, it's meant to be, Michael. You best buy it. Uh, 1999. Black action, gold birds. There's something not right about it. It's, it's a restock. It must be because that quality of workmanship is not Browning standard. I mean, yeah, look at the slipping on the checkering here. The stock is also cracked through the hand. I wonder how much this is, 5344. Four. Should have gone on the app, but I've got a book right here. And amazingly, as I get older, I feel older. 5344. Four. Michael's going to try and beat me on his phone. 5344. Four. Here we go. Browning 12 ball Satori grade six single trigger over and under ejector, 1999, 28 inch nitro barrel, six mil ventilated matte top rib. Six to 800 pounds, cracked and repaired at the hand, seven pound five. Two and three quarter inch chambers, that is a bargain. Given how cheap these are to restock, and to be fair, if that repair holds, don't, don't buy it. I mean, you buy it. I was telling myself, don't buy it. What I don't need in my life is more guns that need repairing that I don't have the time or inclination to repair. Because they're not investments if you never sell them, apparently, I've been told. Anyway, there is one more thing I'd like to show you before we move on. And that is this. Let me, uh, a Remington. Lot 5568. This is an 1889 model top lever hammer gun by Remington in 10 bore. Weighs nine and a half pound, nine pound five. C scroll hammers. Rebounding. Double triggers. A good workhorse stock. Damascus barrels. I have a, a friend who would probably make comment about American Damascus. I have a couple of friends who'd make comment about American Damascus at this point and how it's not the best thing in the world. And it is a little pitted and it is a little rivelled. But you've got 32 inches of barrel and they're like 26 inches away from your face, those weak spots, so that's fine. It's two to 300 pounds for a 10 ball Remington. So I apologize for looking at a couple of American doubles, but I am on a bit of an American double learning spree at the moment. It's interesting to me to learn about the American double gun culture and how that references British and then European double gun culture. Given that perhaps American doubles aren't quite of the same standard and quality as British doubles, a lot of the time when I was learning and young and in the gun trade, they were just if, if ever they came in, which was never, they just were resigned to the scrap bin. So it was interesting, and hence I'm paying extra attention to them now. I haven't seen hardly any, I haven't seen, I have seen hardly any guns in Holt of the American origin. And in this sale, there's like 10 American doubles. That's a lie. Uh, five, which is a lot. This is an interesting little temple. It's far from nice, but it is very American, which means it's good and it's strong and it's gonna be usable. If you want a Temple and you want a Remington, 
lot 5568, two to 300 pounds. That could be a lot, a lot of fun for your money. Just walking out of here and had a quick thought, what if the 3000 was browning using Moroku to demo a potential change in the 525 series? It's probably not true, but the only reason I can think of for those these guys sort of taking one out of left field. I mean, it's also possible that they were producing guns for someone else. And this was just like a, a hangover design. They had all the tooling and machining. I should probably do some more research into the 3000. A Breeder Vega Special. This is not a Breeder. That is a Beretta. Breeder Brescia made in Italy. 5378. So I know that Breeder came up with like the inertia system or started the inertia system now used by Benelli and blah, blah, blah. But do you think they traded patents or something? Yeah, that's a 686. A Breeder Vega Special has got to be a 686. There's no way Breeder would have made their own version. That is a white label 686. There is so many good over and unders. I mean, I skipped through them pretty quick, but I don't want to be showing you the same things I always show because otherwise it would be an hour and a half show about 1980s and 1990s Japanese guns with some Belgian guns thrown in and the occasional Beretta of a decent enough credence, 682, 682 X traps, of which there is one in the sale as well as the collection 96. But I will just have one last little whip round, it's a lovely super grade. Another two great, great five Marukus. Always beware with the high grade Maruks that are in it. Read the description. You're a master of your own destiny when you come to the sealed pit and you have to be careful. Hey, look. A grand European, a brand new, minty looking one with no crack in the stock. Perhaps I should have just waited six months. That's the wrong attitude, isn't it, Michael? It is. Grab life by the horns. That's nice. 5104A. McNabb Highlander. I mean, it's an Italian made gun with an English name on it, but that's, there's plenty of people who do that. These were just one of the first. Very nice little gun for what they are, to be honest. And this one for me, in sort of the hand finish engraving stands out. Just jumped out a mile on a rack full of, I mean, there's some Maruks and things, but yeah, that I kind of look past. How can you look past a Maruk? Look at that. That is an interesting beast. That is not normal. I should finish what I'm saying before. Michael, that's got a European walnut stock on a, not a Maruku. It's a Browning. All right, this is interesting. 5107A. Uh, 2009, hand-finished engraving on a gun, it's nice. I should know what that is. Not odd to me. It's a browning that doesn't automatically screen browning model that I understand. 5107, 5107A. Browning 12 bore, single trigger, open under ejector. Serial number MN, 2009. 30 inch nitro barrel, steel shot proofed. Ventilated mid rib, eight mil top rib, three inch chambers. Protruding mock the chokes, no spares. Eight pound, one ounce, six to eight hundred quid. Foliate scrolling, in, I mean, it's not even in here as a, a model of gun. But the biggest thing for me is that European walnut stock. I mean, I don't know. There you go, there's the bottom line. I don't know exactly what model that is, but it is nice. I'm hoping one of you can tell me. I asked Simon, what gun do you like in here? And he, after sort of five minutes of having a rummage and a deliberate, came up with this. This is a Patston and son of Southampton. Great city, lovely place to live. This is really not. This has, be a little bit loose on the head, is a box lock ejector with 28 inch nitro proof barrels and I guess two and a half inch chambers just to be awkward. Two and a half inch chambers, just to be awkward. But re it's been reproofed at some point in the last, sometime. Got a little bit of color left, and you've got a little game scene. You know, we're not talking superb quality, but the, the scroll work, the loose canvas is really very nice. And you've got some kind of partridgey grouse on the side. But the in work on it is just well finished. And that's kind of indicative of a lot of these provincial makers. They were very good at finishing guns and they were proud that they did it. They're proud enough to put their name on it and that was an important part. We're not talking Holland and Holland quality, but they weren't Holland and Holland pricing. They were selling guns into the market. 
This one's a little loose, but it's 200 to 300 pounds. 200 to 300 pounds. I mean, that is very reasonably priced for a hand-built, probably a Birmingham action barrel set, but hand-finished and all sort of engraved up and completed in Southampton. Not like the world's biggest gun-making town, but quite an important town historically, and even in modern times. Isn't that right, Michael? You're damn right. <laughs> Great football team. And this is the sort of thing you can find in the steel bid. Yes, it needs a rejoint in an ideal world, but you've got a great base for a project that you can work on over time or have pace on piecemeal to work upon. And you can at least get your foot in the door of vintage guns. Beautiful vintage guns. I am a big fan of that. Two to 300 pounds for a nice box lock ejector. Before we check out some rifles, I want to show you this. This is lock 2003 and I'm reading from the book because I'm still filling my eyes with the information about, sorry. Before we leave this room, there is a load of obsolete arms on the wall behind me. And this one jumped out as me as one that I've had a little look at. I did this one, but this one is, is a little bit less nice. Potentially this is an LC Smith 10 bore. And this is a Parker Brothers 10 bore. I told you there is American guns coming out everywhere. And seeing as we look at a lot of Japanese, a lot of British guns, I thought this is like the American gun Holtz episode. This is a Parker E grade. 10 ball, but it's a 10 ball with two and seven eight inch chambers, which makes it obsolete because you can't get that ammunition any longer, which means you can own this off of a license as long as you don't shoot it, provided you don't shoot it. Not that you particularly want to, seeing as this is Damascus under here, and as we've just said about American Damascus, you know, it's not top priority for shooting it. It's a replacement for Endwood, not original. The stock is potentially original, it's got a, a crack that runs down through the hand. You've got the Parker Brothers butt plate that fits in perfectly, which makes me feel like this is original. And it has got some semblance of checking where someone's rubbed and refinished it. But they have then refinished it in this beautiful Parker um, true oil finish, which, oh, it doesn't like fill me with happiness and joy. A gun like this should have oil stained wood from years of hard work. and. This was a gun built at the era of market hunting, just about. Ten bore. I presume the barrels were not always two foot long. It's probably that American Damascus thing we talked about. Yeah, and there's no choke in the end either. This is a, a very interesting prospect. Seven to nine hundred pounds, given that it is an off-license item. A off-license item. Obviously, the, the demand for it's going to be a lot higher because where you're buying a gun that needs to go on license, you kind of hope that you're gonna shoot it. But this, where it is in slightly less good order, but off license, has more value, given that you can just hang it somewhere as long as it's secure and look at it. Although, yeah, shame about the refinish. That's a bit hard. I implore anybody who has a sense of humor to go and read the Holtz listing for many guns, but this one is particularly good for 2003. Uh, words such as gapage are used, as well as the uh, term naive engraving. And naive engraving is a good word for this because I'm sure though it was all done for a price. I'm not sure whether that guy ever actually saw a turkey or, or a Canada goose or whatever kind of big body long neck bird. <laughs> Krigoff Drilling Neptune. This is an interesting one. This is in the 8,000 lots, and all the 8,000s are stock barrel actions only. So unless you're an RFD, when you buy them, they will cut them, cut chunks out of the barrel and permanently disable it, essentially so that you can't sell it on illegally or anything like that. What that means is it's out of proof, won't pass proof or needs serious work. But this one is interesting because it's no longer a drilling. The 12 bore barrels have been sleeved and then the under barrel, the drilling barrel, has been removed, cut off at the bottom, plugged up, and plugged up at the front. I presume that's why it's in here, because sleeve 12 ball barrels should be absolutely fine. But, you know, this is classic Kriegoff gun making. It's an absolute beautiful thing. An absolutely beautiful thing. A bit weird, but the gun itself just jumped off the shelf of me as something that is a real nice bit of classic Kriegoff gun making. Quality engraving. Look at those side clips and how they run out. Come on. You telling me that doesn't do things to you? Funny little things? Oh yes. Look at that. 
I mean, you're telling me this is an unbelievable gun making? Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you wanna support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.